Hey everybody, it's Michael. And Bryce. And before we get started with today's UFO L-Files episode, we have some Patreon shoutouts. These are the fine listeners who have decided to support Bigfoot Collectors Club by going to patreon.com slash Bigfoot Collectors Club and joining the other side where for just a $5 monthly pledge you can not only support the show but unlock three to five bonus episodes every month so here we go cara sexton thank you nick rushton thank you nick emily l thank you casey thank you casey holly thanks mary mayreen bensley thank you andrew flores thank you meg thanks meg vo thank you maybe vio Thank you, Vio or Vio. Maybe married to Jesse Marcel Sr.? We don't know. (laughs) Jody. Thank you. Jonathan Ford. Thanks. Wednesday Lachance. Thanks, Wednesday. Great name. Yeah. Star Lopez. Thank you. Another great name. J.M. Aiello. Thank you. Ashley McClellan. Thank you. Terry Zorko. Thank you. Jamie Tominson. Thank you. Tomason. I added an N. That's inappropriate. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, anyway. Uh, Sally Jane Marie Falconer. Thank you, Sally. Chris Pittman. Thanks, Chris. Sharon Dallas. Thank you. Karen Turley upgraded their pledge. Thank you. R- uh, Wyrell Goodpaster. Thank you, Wyrell. Jamie Quisian upgraded the, their pledge as well. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, long, Jamie. Long-time listener. Wow. Uh, you may remember him as the guy who wrote in the L-Files about the guy in the boat in one wow. of our very first right. episodes. Uh, Mystic Dylan with a very generous pledge. Thank you, Dylan. Wow, thanks, Dylan. Uh, Ian. Thank you. Marina Camp. Thank you. Bunny Tree Evil Eye is back. Thank you, Bunny Tree. Yuna. Thank you. Very generous pledge, by the way. Thank you, Yuna. Thanks, Kelly Yuna. Walker. Thank you, Kelly. Ah, Fairy Godmother Jen Kirkman. Oh, joined. no way. Thanks, yeah. Jen. Wow. Jen, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Elizabeth Stanton. Thank you. And Jason Dembski. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much to all of those uh, listeners who are supporting the show. Right now, on the other side, you can hear our latest episode, which is another Roswell Detour episode where Bryce, Riley, and I, plus special guest Mike Carlson from Podcast Ride, all got together and talked about the Alien Autopsy Fact or Fiction Fox TV special from 1995. Uh, It's a very fun episode. Yeah, Um, if you ever wondered if that thing is real or not, just uh, tune in and find out. We solve it for you. (laughs) Uh, Mike was a blast to have on. We also get into some fun Star Trek discussion. Uh, I think you guys will really enjoy it. Uh, So thank you to everybody who joined. Uh, That's it for Patreon shoutouts. Now it's time for the final episode of Wet Hot Alien Summer. It's time for the show. No! UFO. <laughs> Great. It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I am your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson, and super producer, Riley Bragg. And all of you dear listeners out there, today we end our summer-long adventure, Wet Hot Alien Summer. <laughs> Aww. It's come to a close. We hope you all had a terrific time. We hope you were keeping your eyes on the skies. Uh, and some of you definitely were, because in today's episode, we are going to read your UFO L-Files. These are stories about... Uh, UFOs coming straight from you, the listener. Fantastic. And to uh, unpack all of these tales, we have two amazing guests today. They are actors, writers, comedic performers who also happen to be married. You can catch them every Sunday on the comedy podcast Mega. Boys and girls, please welcome back to the show 
Greg Hess, and Holly Larone. Yay! Hey, what's up? Hello. <laughs> hey, 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 Holly, this is uh, this is very important. Your book ending Wet Hot Alien Summer because your episode on the show was the episode that kicked the whole thing off. <laughs> Ooh, very auspicious. I hope uh, I hope you guys could hear the wet hot alien dog licks that are coming through our, our <laughs> mic. Uh, our dog decided to walk up to us and just start licking my hand right as we started. So and he's, a, a, he's a welcome to guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apologies, <laughs> listeners. It's getting a little hot in here. We've had a lot of dog interruptions uh, during quarantine. Violet barks in the background of every episode now. Baby shows up to scare Bryce occasionally. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Nova is around, but he's so quiet, uh, you'll, ne- you'll never hear him. Boy, I miss that dog so much, Riley. How's Nova Aww. doing? Oh, he's good, you know. It's been really hot, so he just like doesn't want to do anything at all. <laughs> yeah. Hell he yeah. Just- he just lays around and, and does that thing where he puts his head under your hand. He just sneaks Aww. into to petting position. Oh, I miss him. That's truly one of the highlights of the show is getting to see that dog every week. I need to bring him some treats. Oh. Bring, bring him some treats. Some Put so on your treats. hazmat suit and come on yeah. over. Some <laughs> contact-free treat delivery. From just Mr. wipe him down first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Holly, I have to say uh, that we got a lot of amazing feedback after your appearance on the show. A lot Ooh. of people really enjoyed your story about uh, 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 clouds of witnesses. <laughs> and, uh, any updates this summer? Have you expanded your journey on the other side? Uh, yeah, well, I've done a couple of um, capital D drug trips, and so that always helps. <laughs> <laughs> what What is the capital D drug trip? <laughs> um, that's what I like to how I refer to psychedelics, which oh, I feel, amazing. Yeah, are really good for kind of that mind expansion. Like, oh wait, there is a multiverse. Oh wait, I was in a different one for a second. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> uh, Greg, I hope you didn't shit in the ocean this time. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say. Uh, and Greg, after your episode, we got a lot of hate mail and asked, <laughs> asked that man to never, never come back again. Uh, Holly, would you mind expounding or Greg, both of you guys on any of these uh, inner interspace adventures? What? Let's see. Um, was there anything that was particularly uh, funny or fun <laughs> this time? Well, for any of you that have uh, Apple TV out there, I highly <laughs> recommend the screensavers. Just an entire evening of screensavers <laughs> with um, some music behind it. Um, you know, jellyfish, uh, barracuda flying over London. I feel like all the nature stuff is really good w- to look at when you're on psychedelics, and then it will suddenly change to like downtown Dubai, and it just makes you go like, "Oh <laughs> no, oh, bummer, bummer!" <laughs> Blade Runner's real. It's bad. Everything's bad. But one of the really cool, like oodly doodly moments um, that just happened when Greg and I did MDMA together is that. <laughs> And Greg had the great idea. He was like, we should do TM like while we're on MDMA. Let's oh, do yeah. transcendental meditation. So we sat down next to each other on the couch, crossed our legs and dove in and just sort of were like doing the like descending, descending. And um, usually we go for 20 minutes at a pop. And this time right around 15 minutes. So we were five minutes short on what we're used to. In the exact same moment, both of our eyes popped open and our heads turned toward each other and just stared each other in the face and then paused for a second and both went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're connected. You were yeah. on the same, same receiver. Yeah, yeah, it was really weird. It was it like, it was very weird. But also doing TM um, uh, on that um, drug, like, really changed it. It really, really changed it it almost kind of diminished it like your brain is like okay now i'm going to continue to um go back to walking through doors gently rather than coming up to all of the doors with dynamite (laughs) which is i think what the psychedelics do hey you guys are exploring i mean hands off to you that's 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 doing it right there guys what else is there to do right now (laughs) i mean (laughs) really i I know i'm listening to this i'm like this is all happening a block away from me and i'm doing everything (laughs) wrong in my apartment i know mike you know you just have to come by the pool and if we're if you see us just floating the pool staring at the sky you know exactly what's going on and michael i believe that at that exact moment where both of us like 
popped out and toward each other. I believe that just, you know, 400 feet away, whatever you were doing, all of a sudden your eyes opened and you like jerked <laughs> forward. Totally. And now that explains it. I didn't know what was happening. I thought it was just IBS. But oh, yeah. Well, you just got gassy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He somehow, for some reason, he was surprised by Rogue One, one, one for the thousandth time. Yeah, right. I've never <laughs> noticed this, this moment in a Star Wars movie before. <laughs> Um, all right, guys, before we get to your letters, I wanted to kick things off with a little bit of BCC News. Uh, this is a little gem that came to us from one of our listeners, Rachel. It's a short story, but it's getting me excited because I think that perhaps it could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, Athens County, Ohio. This comes from the uh, uh, NBC4.com from uh, Athens County, Georgia. Okay. Athens County Sheriff's Office investigates call involving creature. Hmm. This is from August 19th. The Athens County Sheriff's Office responded to a call for suspicious activity at a state park on Tuesday. With Ohio Department of Natural Resources resources officers unavailable sheriff's deputies responded to the call according to a release from the office the person who made the call to police said they saw a person a across the lake shine a red light in their direction a short time later the caller told police they saw a bipedal creature oh. around three or four feet tall oh. walking near them and looking in their direction okay the Weird. call said that they were uncertain what they saw, but did not believe it to be a person. The mm. sheriff's office patrolled the area, but didn't observe any suspicious activity or creatures at that time. That's all we've got from that story. Evil baby Sasquatch? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking Alien yep. Gray. Oh, okay. All right. Whoa. Hey, it's up for interpretation at this well, point. Three and three and a half to four feet tall. Those are the size of the Roswell yeah. aliens. Ch typical yeah. alien. I mean, there's grays. not much description other than just walking upright with laser red eyes. All right. I mean, it could be anything. Well, you're you're jumping to the conclusion that they were eyes. Oh, it could have been. They just said a red light flashed at them. So right. laser oh. pointer from the. From oh, the right, pointer. right. <laughs> but I think you're, you know, uh, in a lot of these stories, Greg and Holly, we hear, and especially on this uh, episode we did last week with Jordan Morris, uh, sometimes people see Bigfoot creatures that have glowing red eyes or glowing green eyes. Mm. Mm. I was actually going to ask you about that. What are the most uh, frequent colors that are seen? Because I think we have another story coming up with a red light and a white light. And I was wondering if if there's ever instances of other colors of light. Yeah, we're working on a lightsaber related Bigfoot eyes type theme here to see if we can't <laughs> determine which ones are good, evil, or, uh, right. or somewhere in between. So and this uh, means the jury's also, out. <laughs> this also means that maybe J.R.R. Tolkien uh, was privy to some of these creatures because didn't Gollum's eyes go from green to pink? Oh, yeah, when he would switch between Smeagol. But I don't know if they were glowing. They were just sort of like the iris, the color in his eyes would change. But he I is just... a three to four foot tall bipedal creature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys know this, but Holly tries to bring the Lord of the Rings into every <laughs> podcast that she Great. goes on, including our own podcast, which has nothing to which, which is about a mega church. So just uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> well, mission accomplished. <laughs> Check. <laughs> to answer your question, I think when it comes to UFOs, we hear a lot of white and green, but sometimes we get blue, like blue fireballs come up a lot, and then just multicolored lights like Christmas tree. I, I think there's a wide range of stuff yeah. uh, that you can get with these things. I, I mean, here, here's a story that I just pulled up off the UFO stalker site on the MUFON uh, website. So, hey, I guess surprise segment... Move on, UFO Roundup. Yeah. 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 All right, so this is a uh, witness report from just this past week uh, describing a cigar-shaped UFO with multiple lights. This is from, uh, where was this found? This was found in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on August 20th, uh, which is just yesterday as of this recording. So here we go. Here's the detailed description. 
As we were driving north, it says northeast bound on Route 581 Bridge, something made me think to look from the passenger seat where I was sitting. Ooh, maybe he was doing some MDMA across <laughs> the back seat, driver's side window. Sorry, I might, we're, uh, we're with you. That's it. That's no, the story. No, that's the story. That's it. <laughs> really? MoveOn.org. My, my computer just hiccuped. When I did, I was shocked to see a line of four to five steady, glowing white lights in a line as if all part of the same craft that was cigar-shaped. Hmm. I shouted, OMG, a cigar-shaped UFO. <laughs> I had the phrase fresh in my brain because I had been thinking about cigar-shaped UFOs all day, on and off. I even bought a pack of cigars that same day, something I hadn't done since 1995. <laughs> oh, my God, I love this guy. Wow. My friend who was driving took a quick look out her window, which was open, and said, Well, I'm a believer now. She pulled over to stop the vehicle along the shoulder of the highway to get a better look. I got out and tried to find the UFO again, but I couldn't. Neither could my friend. It's as if it just vanished. Time of sighting was 9.45 p.m. approximately, and it lasted about 90 seconds to two minutes. The UFO was in the northwest sky (laughs) below any clouds, but it was a cloudless night and the stars were out. The UFO appeared to stay in one spot and made no sound that we were aware of. My friend said that the light seemed square-shaped and the silhouette looked black and cigar-shaped. Interesting. Wild. I love that they were... I do enjoy the synchronicity of the idea of this person was thinking about cigar-shaped UFOs all day, bought a pack of cigars for the first time ever. uh, And then then, then saw a cigar-shaped UFO. Yeah, that's what pops out in my mind. That's certainly interesting. Um, Seems to be summoning something. That's he was very... under their control. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you think about? I mean, that's a strange uh, synchronicity. What's your take on that, Greg and, and Holly? Um, I mean, if he hadn't had a Swisher Sweet since '95, I think that was the day to do it. That's for sure. <laughs> Sig a cigar like Cuba Q Bar. That's a uh, that's a Will Smith lyric that no one remembers. Sig a cigar. <laughs> that's uh, getting jiggy with it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Dude. That's right. <laughs> I once performed getting jiggy with the karaoke in uh, in a sushi oh, no. restaurant in the south side of Pittsburgh, and oh. I crushed it. Not a good idea. I'm sure oh, you did. God. I'm sure you probably did. Oh, you know what? I do kind of love that they both had a like a nonchalance about it, though. It was just like, oh, my God. And she was like, yep, that's it. I'm a believer now. I just I know. It's like, what's going to really surprise these people? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. I like that he shortened the three syllables of oh my god to OMG down to three syllables. Yeah, it's I got I got stuck on that too. I was like, does anyone actually say OMG? Yeah, it takes, especially to a UFO. It takes the exact amount of time as saying oh my god. Just say oh my god. And you know they weren't teenagers because they were buying Swisher Sweets in 1995. That's so right. they're at least my age. That's right. That's right. And it also makes me think all this stuff about lights, like the red light the green light the white lights the square lights it it makes me think too that like it could be we have so few colors in the spectrum that we can actually see you know how we can see yeah uh roy g biv and like butterflies can see like fat ten thousand colors it actually makes me wonder if like these lights are are you know millions of different colors but we reduce them down to like what our only what our brain can take in yeah, it's a great point. I mean, that makes that makes a whole lot of sense. You know, like you just mentioned, we only see a tiny, tiny uh, spectrum of the visible light and, and, and auditory, too. We only hear so much uh, in the frequency zone. So who knows what these things are actually emitting and, and, and what we're picking up on. And uh, if we can actually see the occupants of the craft with the naked eye as well. You know, I think about how some of these beings might not appear on our spectrum that they have to sort of phase in and out for us to see them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they could be there the whole time and we just can't always experience them and for some reason these little blips like a thin space where we see it for a second. It's not like it's leaving, it's just that our senses aren't inadequate. Maybe? Gosh. Fascinating. I like all of this stuff. Bryce, you see a lot of orange lights, right? Like you see orange orbs. You've caught a few of those on camera. <laughs> Well, I've only seen like I've only caught one orange orb on on camera, but the majority of the 
of the anom- anomalous things I see are these little sort of white dots in the sky. And it's usually in the daytime. And they sort of lazily move around the sky, uh, which tells me they're they're not a plane, they're not a satellite, uh, they're not a star because they're not fixed in their position. And and uh, it, what, what, what really sort of boggles in mind is there's always this sense that that whatever you're looking at is aware that you're looking at it. So there's this, uh, there's this interrelationship that's taking place and it's, it's, a, it's a very strange thing. I always try to take pictures of them too. Um, but usually I have to run in and get my camera and then, then I come back out and they're gone, which is always disturbing. Have you that's ever what- captured them? Yeah, I've got I've got pictures of uh, I I probably got about five or six pictures of uh, of these little things that I always see and it and it's funny like these guys that saw the UFO I'm always like you know it, it always comes as a signal to be like you know uh, look up I I wonder if I'm going to see something right now you know and uh, so I I don't know what's taking place it's very strange I mean hey it could be something usually you know my family always laughs and there's a fucking balloon and I'm like I don't know I don't know. <laughs> Isn't but. that like a? I was just trying to remember. Isn't that some quantum theory too? Like once you observe something, it actually changes the behavior of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Uh, yeah once you observe it, it uh, breaks down the waveform. What what is that? Ex- the double slit experiment. Yeah, yeah, when, slit, uh, yeah. An observed particle will actually collapse its wave function, and uh, once it's observed, and 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 change material form, which is wow. which is crazy. So which, maybe that's. Which, Maybe that's sort of what's going on. It, I think so. I mean, you know, look, I, yeah, I'm fascinated by that, that this is an observer created uh, or manipulated world. So we have a direct effect uh, in our reality. You know, we, we, we help um, make up this reality that we all exist in. Yeah. Guys, time to uh, get in that swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we even need the mushrooms today. <laughs> Hold on. Let me turn on my uh, screensaver. And I'm going to randomize the transitions, too. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's dive into the mailbag from our listeners. Uh, and I want to kick this off by thanking a few listeners who sent in actual physical mail to us uh, this past week or over the summer. Uh, sorry it took us a while to get it due to COVID. Uh, I'm not making a ton of trips to the post office, although now it seems like I should be making a lot more post post office trips. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Claudia, Rachel, David and KVH, same Rachel who sent in that story, by the way, for uh, initials KVH uh, for expanding our clubhouse library. They sent us. Uh, an amazing map of Ohio, of all the weird uh, cryptid sightings in Ohio. This thing is huge and detailed. Oh, yeah, our gift bag, our gift grab. Oh, my God. Thank you for sending that stuff. What a fun day that was. We got our first Bailey uh, school kids book, uh, something about, what was it? The snowman doesn't what juggle or something. What was? Yeah, I can grab it. Uh, so I don't know. The, the abominable title snowman doesn't do something. Uh, so this is a series of children's books, Holly and Greg, that have been popping up uh, in conversation on the show. We discovered one based on the title uh, "Bigfoot Doesn't Square Dance." And oh, apparently, yeah. it's all about monsters saying contradictory monsters doing the things that that says they don't do on the on the cover of the book. Here themselves. it is, right here. The abominable snowman doesn't roast marshmallows. Marshmallows. Let mm. it snow. Let it snow. Let it. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we got some tarot cards. We got a giant collection of time life books and some other uh, paranormal encyclopedias. Uh, if you want to send us physical mail, you can always write into us at Bigfoot Collectors Club, PO Box eleven zero seven, Hollywood, California. Nine zero zero six eight, and uh, it might take a minute, but we'll eventually get those in our hot little hands. And when we get back into the real clubhouse, we're gonna we're gonna uh, add all of this stuff to our library. So thank you so much, listeners, for sending Definitely. those in. All right, I'm gonna kick this off with a letter that's not necessarily a UFO story, uh, but you'll see why I bring this up. This letter is called "Eavesdropping on Apollo." Dear Michael, Riley, but mostly Bryce, Mm. 
We are writing to you as amateur radio subjects matter experts, hams, and, am- and amateur and, uh, astronomers. There goes my uh, dog right now. My husband and I are huge fans and have been listening to the whole catalog of episodes. We have gone on many road trips that have been centered around tales of high strangeness and enjoy your company. We just recently listened to episode 119, the Kecksburg UFO crash with Holly Laurent. Please read in a fa- fancy French accent. Holly <laughs> Laurent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> At one point, Bryce brought up the BCC news of the SpaceX UFO. He also brought up this reminding him of being able to listen to astronauts on ham radios after they stopped broadcasting to the public. Then Michael promptly started laughing at Bryce, making him second guess himself. <laughs> well, <laughs> sounds about right. <laughs> we wanted to load you up with some cold, hard facts. When it came to the Apollo missions, <laughs> this one specific guy built a system to be able to listen to the astronauts talk to one another. Unfortunately, he could not decode the moon to earth communications link. I'm obviously paraphrasing this as much as I can. Attach is an article from QST, a ham magazine. Don't worry, Bryce. You don't actually have to read it all, but it oh, goes through God. how he did it. Wow. <laughs> Defend? Coming to your defense? And then I like these guys. <laughs> slamming you. Uh, present day, most communications are done via satellite and cannot be eavesdropped on. That being said, there is a ham radio on the International Space Station, and many astronauts get their amateur uh, radio license. They fill their they fill their they fill their time downtime talking to people all over the world, and it has become a lot easier to talk to an astronaut nowadays. Anyways, we've both had many paranormal experiences and have never had the inclination to write in, but for some reason, this is where we drew the line. Thanks for letting us nerd out. Um, so listeners, uh, thank you and uh, send in some of your paranormal stories. But I stand corrected. I didn't know that you could talk to astronauts using a ham radio. That's mind blowing to me. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that is wild. <clears throat> Remember beginning a contact, little Jody Foster is there on her little ham radio, just <laughs> <That's> uh, <right. laughs> looking up at the stars and trying to talk to people. That's what it's all about, Michael. Wasn't yeah, there well, also a movie where some guy talked to his dead dad on a ham radio that was a firefighter? Yes, Dennis Quaid, right? Oh, God, yeah. What the, what the hell was that? Oh, uh, yeah. He's like talking to him in the future or something. Was John Travolta in that movie? That uh, seems like probably. A- sure, let's right. throw him in there. Yeah, <laughs> it feels right. <laughs> also, uh, Nick Cage. I don't know. Yeah. Was it Face Off? No, I can't no, yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably Face Off. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bryce, I guess I owe you another apology. Hey, uh, all right. I'll take it. I was wrong. You were right. God, that feels so um, good. That's the way it usually goes. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time to dig into your UFO L files. <laughs> Uh, so the the movie is Frequency. It came out in the year two thousand with uh, Dennis Quaid and Jim Caviezel. Yeah. Wow! There you go. Good pull. We figured it out while let's we all, were on a break. Let's all head and not watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that being a BCC or a, or a Bigfoot Collectors Club movie over on the Patreon. Who knows? We'll see. Um, all right, let's kick things off. Bryce, why don't you read your first letter of the night? Sure. Hi, Michael, Bryce, and Riley. I love the podcast and have been meaning to write to you about a family experience for a while now, but finally I have the time uh, now that we're in quarantine. I'll first tell you about my grandfather's experience in the 60s, which is the reason I first started believing in aliens when I was younger. To preface this story, I should tell you that I grew up in a small, very strange mountain town in Northern California, like actually Northern, almost in Oregon, called Mount Shasta. Oh, we're familiar with Mount Shasta. Oh, yeah. The town and mountain are infamous for all sorts of weirdness, including plenty of alien encounters, the legend of the city inside the mountain called Lemuria, and all sorts of strange people that flock to the town because of the mountain. Like very niche religions, someone claiming to be the reincarnation of the ascended master Saint Germain, who is actually uh, a friend of my husband's, and crystal shops on every block. It's my favorite place in the world. Yeah, we did a story of high strangeness on uh, on Saint Germain. What yeah, a very was... mysterious uh, figure. And one on Mount Shasta with Matt Gorley as the guest. Yeah, combine those two uh, for your listening fun. My grandfather was a very no-nonsense man. 
From what I remember of him, he was kind, but sort of a hardened Vietnam War vet who had to be the last person you would expect to believe anything out of the ordinary existed. On top of all this, he was also the police captain of Mount Shasta in 1963. He had a shared UFO encounter while in a patrol car with another officer. I have a copy of the local newspaper article written about his experience, so I'll pull some excerpts directly from it and also attach it to this email for you to see. Great. Quote, This is the way Brown recalls his first encounter with unknown forces. He and fellow Mountain Shasta officer Peter Chinko were on night patrol in 1963 in a police car. They noticed lights against the dark bulk of 9,700-foot Mount Edie, west of the city. At first, they thought the lights were from vehicles on logging roads on the mountain. But when they peered through field glasses, they saw that the lights were in, a, in the side of a disc or covered saucer. It was hovering over Mount Edie's slopes. It was a beautiful moonlit night, Brown recalls. He and Chinka estimated that the UFO was 10 miles away and that its length was between 30 and 50 feet. The lights along its rim shifted from brilliant green to red and silver. All at once, there was a burst of speed. Brown told a record searchlight reporter in 1967, the UFO skimmed over the shoulder of Mount Edie and disappeared. China later confirmed Brown's report in record searchlight interviews. Um, I wonder if he meant China or the uh, the officer uh, uh, Peter Chinka. Chinka. I'm not sure. Probably yeah. Chinka. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I don't think China got involved. In the <laughs> I was going to say, wow, that's international uh, international <laughs> thing here. The officers had reported the sighting to the U.S. Air Force. They were deluged with report forms, all to be filled out in triplicate. After weeks of filing out the forms, the Air Force told them that they had really seen some kind of illusion. Brown said. The experience convinced Brown that only a masochist would report a UFO sighting to the military a second time. I get that. Brown's next encounter came in 1966. He was alone in a patrol car at night on the northern fringe of Mount Shasta. It was past midnight, and again, there was sparkling moonlight. Abruptly, the car's engine died. Ooh. Then the lights went out. And the police radio went silent, he recalls. Light streaming down from above the car made him lean forward and peer upward through the windshield. Quote, I thought to myself, my God, what is this thing? End quote. He recalls the experience with great fear for an instant. But almost immediately, he felt a sense of not being threatened. Abruptly, the car lights came on and the radio came alive. Brown radioed to the police officer half mile southward and asked David Vicari to run out into Main Street, look northward, then report what he saw. Vicar went outside. His return was so fantastic. Quote, it sounded like he was tearing the office apart, end quote, Brown recalled later. He radioed Brown confirming the presence of the UFO hovering over the northern section of town. Vicari was still excited when he told a record searchlight reporter in 1967 that the object he saw was a great big blue light. I saw it good. It was a great big one. I don't know what it is. It's just a thing. I don't know whether it's a flying saucer or not. OMG. Just kidding. <laughs> I, added, I added that part. The UFO, according to Brown, was about 40 feet in diameter, saucer shaped, and equipped with a pair of curved skids or pipes on its lower side. It gave off a brilliant light that Brown described as an eerie greenish blue. The UFO wasn't spinning. It hovered motionlessly above the patrol car. Abruptly, it zipped away southward for about a half a mile, then turned sharply eastward and vanished over the shoulder of Mount Shasta. Brown tried to chase it in the car, but was hopelessly outdistanced. Brown later found another Mount Shasta resident who'd witnessed part of the phenomenon. George Ricom Ricomini couldn't sleep that night and was in his bathroom when the lights went out and a greenish glow came in the window to light up the entire room. Brown says the jibes and kidding he'd endured haven't shaken his conviction that he saw something on two occasions. I'll never change my version of it, he said last week. He isn't a science fiction addict and the experiences haven't made him into a UFO fanatic, he says. But when I go out late at night, I always keep my eyes open, he says. I figure they contacted me once, and they may do it again. The stories told by Brown, Vicari, and Chinka are particularly interesting for two reasons. They were policemen, 
and had been trained to some extent in accurate observation and reporting, and being policemen, they would be reluctant to report something that would bring ridicule upon them and even damage their careers once it was entered in their personal records. Sorry for the length of this story, but with it being such a well-documented encounter, I thought it deserved not to be skimped on. Here's a little more to the story. My dad told me that when he was in high school, after all this had happened, the FBI came to the house to interview, read interrogate, my grandpa about the encounter. He said they were basically trying to bully him into retracting everything he had said about the incident, but he refused. My dad said they were back a few more times after that, but grandpa never budged. I also attached the drawing he made of the craft, which looks like the classic saucer of the time. What do you guys think? Was it aliens? or the government. Thanks again for reading. Keep doing what you do and stay safe. Best faith. Well, there you go. Wild. Nice. Yeah. Mount, Mount Shasta is such a weird and mysterious place. I mean, maybe it's something about the, I don't know, just the, the geography itself or the, but I don't know. People report all kinds of crazy shit coming in and out and uh, from within that Mount Shasta. Bryce, you guys have been up there, right? I, yeah. I, I've been – not together as a team, but we should. Uh, I mean, yeah, I've, this I've letter made me area. want to become policeman in Mount in Shasta because <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a pretty low-stress job, you know, just busting probably a couple meth dens here and there. But then yeah. but then you get to see Ascended Masters in UFOs. Yeah. Now that pot's legal, those guys don't have anything to do but chase aliens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, and man. I'm assuming water doesn't flow out of Mount Shasta, but different flavors and colors of soda pop. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. My dad was a Shasta man. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, do you guys happen to know that it made me think when you were doing that bit about China, but um, China, uh, as I as I Trumpify it, but what countries are the most uh, uh, forthcoming with their UFO? you know, oh yeah, research or insight? Are, is there anybody that's that sort of like here's think, here's what we got? There I think is. UK and Canada are really starting to drop a lot of information. Well, in South America and Mexico and uh, countries like Brazil have always been transparent and very open about their uh, UFO files. Oh, interesting. It's yeah, really it it's be... really Russia and the United States that have always kept pretty hush hush about the whole thing. Yeah, wow. it seems like in South America, it's more part of the, uh, it's more accepted in the culture, you know, and I don't know if that just goes mm-hmm. back to indigenous roots of like people seeing, you know, gods in the sky and that kind of stuff or what, but it's, it seems to be more ingrained in the culture and more accepted in South America. And Along America. with taking midday naps and dancing. Oh, that, let's all move to yeah, South America. Oh, They're yes, it right. <laughs> that, that's living. Do you have any theories or do you know anything specifically about why the United States in general tends to try to squash these things? Um, I mean, I would say it's probably related to, uh, the cold war and and then if we're really gonna buy into the ufo myth it might be because they actually found a crash saucer at roswell and alien occupants and they've been keeping a lid on that uh so that other countries don't know what sort of advanced technology we've been uh, well, given to, access to and to add to that whatever these things are and they've been seen by military personnel of all uniform they seem yeah. to invade our airspace with impunity yeah and so this is a this is a national security matter for um you know for that reason and so i think the us government until they have You know, that's what's so fascinating about all these, you know, main press articles that are starting to come out about the UFO UAP phenomenon and the government's, um, you know, program in studying them is that, uh, you know, we're we're starting to try to figure out, does the government know what's going on or are they still trying to figure it out for themselves? But either way, these things are um, clearly moving about, uh, you know, on their own volition and and, and invading our best fighter pilots. Yeah, and I've always said this on the show, um, but, but you know, the the whole idea of the, the the main purpose of the government is to protect its citizens from foreign invasion. That's one of the big reasons why we have a federal government. And if they were to come out and say, "Okay, there are aliens and they are visiting," one of the first questions would be, "Okay, so how are you protecting us?" To which the government would be able would not be able to say that they could because yeah. it and and then once that happens. Like the entire conceit 
of the government completely collapses, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think part of it is they, they can't admit that because then they're admitting that they're powerless to save us from advanced, you know, technology. So better to keep everyone under the illusion that we're all protected when we're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I dig that theory, you know? But um, all right, Holly, you have a letter from one of our listeners. I thought this one was pretty interesting. Why don't you dive in? Great. This is from Teresa. Um, And yeah, this is good. Also UFO related. Here we go. Okay, so diving right in. Last night, I had three distinct UFO sightings, and it was awesome. I had to share. Quick background. Last night was July 29th. I live in the city of Portland, Oregon. I am about 2.5 miles northeast of the protest epicenter. And last night we were sitting outside hearing the drone of a helicopter downtown the whole time we were out there, which was actually kind of unusual. We've had protests for weeks, as you know, but the hours long helicopter hangout was definitely ha- hangout has definitely not been a thing most nights. Long story short, there's some shit happening in Portland, in a two-block radius downtown, and last night wasn't the craziest. But for whatever reason, there was a lot of helicoptering going on. Also, I want to say, I'm not someone who has seen UFOs a lot. My husband and I both once saw something in the sky when we lived in Vegas about seven years ago. But that was it. Until last night. I like that she's like, I haven't seen him a lot. A lot, but I have. (laughs) This all happened between 10 and 11.30 p.m., seen from my backyard in northeast Portland. Event number one. I was looking up at the sky because there's nothing else to look at, really. It wasn't easy to see (laughs) this. Makes sense. Checks out. (laughs) Yeah. I follow. It wasn't easy to see the stars because the moon was pretty bright. So I was surprised and geeked out when I spotted a satellite because they're hard to catch. I assumed it had to be a satellite because it was far too high to be a plane. Helicopters and planes were flying around sporadically also, so I could only tell that this was much higher. It was also moving in a steady arc, which made me think it was a satellite. The properties of it were a bit odd, which is why I kept watching. When I say properties, I mean there was a light but it was fuzzy around the edges. Later, it would look more like a comet than just a dot of light. There was sort of a rippling around it, too. If it had been lower and the night cloudier, I would have said the light from it was reflecting off clouds. As it was, it just seemed to have a sort of wavy light around it. Anyway, it stopped being a satellite to me when it got to the edge of where I could see it. My sightline was constrained by the circle of trees in my yard to one section of the sky. Like it knew the edge, it went up quickly and then back the way it came. When it got to the other edge of the sky, it went down again. It kind of made a box and then went back across the sky and out of my line of sight behind a tree. It was weird. I tried to get a video but with the night sky, it was just black. The whole thing lasted maybe five minutes, and the thing was so small that my husband only saw it a couple of times briefly. He kept losing it in the sky. It was hard to see. (laughs) O-M-G. Event number two. Maybe 20 minutes later, I'm still sitting there with my husband, still probably just looking at my phone, when my husband goes, Do you see that? I looked up and somehow directly at what he was referring to. Up in the sky was a bright orange-yellow light, much larger than a star, like a huge glowing orb. I only got a split-second look at it because it was like as soon as I saw it, the light kind of collapsed in on itself and became the same satellite-esque thing I had been watching earlier. Weird. Cool. It seriously seemed like it wanted my attention, And then once it had it, it was like, okay, watch me again and stop staring at your phone, you fool. Yeah, look at the sky. You got to look at the sky. There's nothing else to look at. Don't look at your phone. (laughs) I do love that it's just within 20 minutes, you're just back to scrolling on Instagram after seeing the UFO. So bad. Then it started moving across the sky again in the same pattern. Across, up, 
back the way it came, across, and then behind a tree and out of sight. Somehow I knew that was the end. My husband definitely saw the bright light, but had trouble tracking it again once it became the smaller light. This time it was more like a smudge in the sky. It was the same thing for sure, with the ripply nature, but it was somehow a little elongated. And it was moving across the sky pretty quickly, not erratic at all, but also not in a super logical way. Event number three. My husband and I are now paying more attention to the sky. <laughs> I was really scared for a second. I thought she was going to say my husband and, now, and I are now split up. <laughs> uh, we never got along. That happened 20 minutes after the second sight. <laughs> right, yeah. Why can't you see it, babe? <laughs> right after event number two, we saw a pinpoint light, which looked like maybe it could have been a drone or craft or something of that kind but something about it made us both lock on because it just moved moved too smoothly if that makes sense it's like the ryan gosling of ufos (laughs) too smooth and you can't look away it appeared to be coming towards us and we watched it for a few seconds as it did as it did that but then it just faded away it was weird you could kind of detect it was fading for a second and then it was just gone So it couldn't have been a drone. It didn't drop out of the sky or anything. It kept up in the same arc towards us, meaning it was way up in the sky, but it was like coming forward, not going across. Hard to explain. But then it just burnt out. Maybe that one was a shooting star, but it was a very controlled display. And with everything else, that would be too weird. This was like two minutes after event number two. Although now that I'm typing, that reminds me that at the very beginning of the evening, around 10 o'clock, when we first sat outside, my husband did say he saw a shooting star and was obviously stoked about it because that is cool shit. So maybe there were four events. I like that she's able to. I, I can't. I can't. I, I, I think of my whole day as one event. And I love that. she. Can, <laughs> I, I love that she can split these events into three and in, within a matter of minutes. This is really. Wow. I need to rethink my whole life. That's you're too damn high, Greg. <laughs> I, I imagine you in like an argument now. When I came home, event number four. <laughs> yeah. and, and you were there in the kitchen. Let's call that event five. That was so previous. Cool. To event number three, and we both know it. Seriously, man, it's August, but I feel like since March, I've just been in one event. Yeah, yeah, same. yeah that no makes shit. sense. Okay, yeah, so weird. okay, so the final part of the letter is oh, that's it. The location in the sky, kind of southwest of us, made me wonder if the UFOs were interested in the protests going on in downtown Portland. The entire time we observed this, there was the constant sound of a helicopter coming from somewhere, so presumably it was another active night down there. But it's hard to tell distance and location in the sky, so maybe I was just projecting that they might have been interested in the activity in the area of the protests. But seriously, there was just so much activity in the sky that night, visually and audibly. And we could see Jupiter and Saturn super clearly too. It was just weird. And at the time, I was like, quote, I don't have the eerie sense of calm like people say with UFO sightings, unquote. But then looking back today and typing this, why was I? Why wasn't I more freaked out? We yeah. were watching the sky like it was a freaking TV show. Things just kept happening, and we were like, "This is normal." <laughs> anyway, I had to share. Hopefully, the UFO flap in Portland means I'm due for a Bigfoot sighting. Love you guys. Love the show. Thanks for doing what you do, Teresa. Awesome. Well That's done. So great, Holly. What do you think this these things are? Let's assume just for a second that that they're not uh, are aircraft or or anybody else's or aircraft. drones or drones i can picture drones wanting to film some of the protests and stuff there's also know? been reports of, of military drones above uh, some of the protests so they could have been interested in the protests but maybe not so alien and not so much fun but oh, you know, so holly ignore the that question let's just skip past your your response <laughs> <laughs> i i do believe it's um an intelligence from outside of our uh, outside of our shit um what yeah. th- and and um 
I, I really do. I really, really do. It's some otherness and it's intelligent. And I believe deeply that it is good and, and kind in the peaceful sense of that. And I also would like to say if there's any way they can like catch some of our vibrations or whatever, I have a request. Please help us. Please help us. Please, especially be with us in November. Show up in droves. Come and work your magic. You are more advanced than we are and we need help. I didn't know this was going to be an SOS. I know. <laughs> oh, yes, we definitely need a little extraterrestrial aid right now. I, I agree. All totally. right. Let's move on to our next wet, hot alien summer story. Hello, everyone. I recently came across your podcast while searching for stuff related to all things high strangeness and was delighted to hear your wet, hot alien summer series and subsequently asking for listener stories. So I am more than excited to share my experiences. And apologies if this seems long winded, but there are some things to cover. You know what? You ask people for their UFO accounts and you get like books as emails, but we like it. We dig it. These are long emails today, but but we're into it. The Meeting Place. About 11 years ago, just as I was starting university, ooh, I wonder if this person's British, my parents decided to buy a cabin in late August. The very same week I moved out and into my dorms, the cabin is north of Ottawa, Canada. Huh, that explains it. Definitely British. In the Quebec <laughs> interland. <laughs> After they had spent a good month or so refurbishing it, I finally got to visit and see it during Thanksgiving mid-break in, in mid-October. Oh boy, Canadian Thanksgiving in October. You guys do everything crazy the there. <laughs> the view from the deck overlooking the lake was spectacular, leaving a totally unencumbered view of the sky. Dad and I were excited to do some serious stargazing. The first night was cloudy, but the second night offered clear skies, and after dinner we went out to look. Being a good former Boy Scout, having earned my astronomy badge, Dad asked if I knew where Polar Polaris was. I scanned the sky and saw bright light, which turned out to be a passing plane. When I said, oh, that's just a plane, Dad responded with, yes, there's a few of them out. That one over there has a weird flight pattern. Confused, I looked across to the other side of the lake to see this faint light that is moving side to side, back and forth, up and down, in a slow speed, in what looked like a rectangular pattern, very similar to Holly's story. Mm -hmm. I was stunned and said, uh, that's not a plane, to which my dad responded, oh, well, then it's just some sort of cosmic phenomenon. He was always <laughs> skeptical about the paranormal and UFOs. Now get back in the car and never back talk me again. <laughs> that would go with mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I say was... We, con we continue to watch. I don't know if that means his father passed or his father's now a believer. Uh, I hope it's I hope it's the, the 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 latter, not the former. We'll find out, I guess. We continue to watch for five minutes, doing the same maneuver. Eventually, Dad got bored and went inside to grab a slice of pie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is so endearingly Canadian. <laughs> Of course, just as soon as he turned away, I saw the light emit some sort of smaller light in a sort of arc. Then both lights faded away into the night. Throughout the years, nothing else really happened, save for some odd lights, fireballs in the sky, and all on the other <laughs> side of the lake. I mean, that's... Can we, that's I the mean, throwaway so, line? That's the <laughs> cosmic <laughs> phenomenon, you know. Fireballs yeah. floating yeah. around your lake? <laughs> no, That <big>. is... <laughs> Sorry, Greg. <laughs> Uh, that is until 2017. In mid-September of that year, my sister, who was living in Florida, escaped the wrath of Hurricane Maria and drove three days straight up to visit our parents. I was encouraged to come up to the cabin and escape the humidity of the city and have one last swim before autumn came. Oh, just, I mean, you really paint a beautiful picture here, listener. One evening, I decided to go for a walk and made my way towards a campground which had recently been purchased and redeveloped so new owners put in a basketball court and i knew uh, and i knew where the and i knew where the balls were kept so i shoot some hoops and after about four minutes a very bright light catches my eye it is low and exceptionally bright if this had been venus or any other planet i would have certainly seen it in the days prior 
I stare at it for a while before literally walking backwards towards the cabin, keeping an eye on it, making sure it doesn't disappear. When I got back, I rush in, grab our telescope, and tell Dad to put down that pie and get out here and see this. I had to put my part. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is he still he's still eating pie all yeah. these years? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so great. Luckily, this object is right smack dab in the middle between two trees, and I set up the telescope and find it in the eyepiece easily. Ooh, we're going to get a closer look. What I saw stunned me. It was perfectly round, translucent, but the center looked to have heat waves or waves emanating from it like ripples on water. The color was a purplish blue, and the edges were golden lights. With the naked eye, it looked not to be moving, but I would constantly have to adjust the telescope to keep it in view. My dad looked at it and was completely shocked. Now I'm just picturing, like, pie falling out of his open mouth. <laughs> yeah, totally. Open mouth, yeah. Cut to, pie hits the floor. Shattered porcelain. Dad is gone. He's already back inside. Yeah. <laughs> Where he was, a yeah. fork remains. Yeah. Uh, my sister looked at it and couldn't figure out what it was. Two neighbors passed by and saw the light, but were probably a bit too drunk to really care. Hey, Holly, <laughs> Holly and Greg, were you guys visiting Canada in 2017? Canadian version of us is out there having a good time. <laughs> Your doppelgangers. <laughs> yeah. This object drifted above the cabin for 20 minutes before disappearing behind the tree line. I wanted to keep looking at it, so I ran down the trail, which walking would have taken five minutes, but running as fast as I did took 30 seconds or so, to the initial uh, road leading to the camp, which offers a clear view of the surrounding open field. But when I reached it and looked around, the object was gone, the sky empty. As I said before, Dad was a skeptic of all things UFO, but now fully believes and this experience drew us closer oh that's nice but the weird doesn't end there literally the day after this i followed an atv trail that leads past the camp this was about 1 p.m in the afternoon and as i reached a clearing in the tree canopy i was compelled to look up when i saw this thing fly over me with great speed and bank left the second it was over me oh no no exhaust trail It was smaller than a standard jet, about the size of a snowbird plane. I've attached a photo for reference. But the wings were curved inward, and the center looked like that of a goose-thin neck with a goo of a goose, a thin that of a goose-thin neck with a bulb sort of head. If you were to imagine the rebel insignia from Star Wars, but thinner. Oh, I can imagine it because it's thinning <laughs> right now. You're next talking to Michael's language. Sorry, I just have no reference. All I can think about is a goose head. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the the that Princess Leia used a goose as her sigil in the Star Wars. <laughs> it made a sound, but very quick and sh- very sharp. This leads me to believe it was man-made, but I do not recognize the craft of any sort of military aircraft I've seen before or since. There's no Air Force base is near the cabin, not for hundreds of kilometers away, and the closest airport is a small one, solely for pleasure crafts, ooh, pleasure craft, and isn't for another 50 kilometers. This craft was not headed towards or from it at all. A few months later, as my parents were cleaning out the basement of my cabin, my mom came across a scrap of paper from the local newspaper from the 70s with an article detailing the sighting of an unknown craft drifting above the closest town to which a number of residences saw. Since these encounters, nothing has really been seen save for the still strange lights at night every so often. Those fucking fireballs. But these experiences have completely upended my view of reality and the nature of our place in the cosmos. Since then, my interest of all things high strangeness has only increased my love to explore the mysterious side of our reality and the wibbly-wobbly nature of it. This had been heightened when I found out the translation of the name of the lake in the local Algonquin language is... Oh, yeah. Give it to me. The Meeting Place. Oh, yes. Nice. Thanks very much for taking the time to read this. I'm eager to hear more stories from others and all the weird things you guys will be covering. Take care in these strange times. Nick R. Ooh, thanks, Nick. Wow, that's a cool story. Yeah, yeah great letter. Well, well written. written. Yeah. I wonder what kind of pie it was. I know. Yeah. That was the one <laughs> Probably thing. Probably pepperoni. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pepperoni. It was a pizza pie. <laughs>
probably Twin. a gooseberry pie. Eh? Yeah. We got some hey. <laughs> maple gooseberry pie. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. It's called the meeting place. I wonder, you know, if there's something to that entomology of it also being a spiritual meeting place. Yeah, who knows? That's wild. Wild stuff. Riley, you have a story to read for us. I sure do. I just, I still, I, I can't get over that he saw it in a telescope. That's so. That cool. is yeah. fucking cool. Yeah, let's that that <clears throat> translucent with the translucent. white golden lights emitting from it. Yeah, yeah. you know, Very you awesome. know what got me on Instagram the other day is I'm seeing a lot of ads and there was this like super handheld scope and I was like, oh, <laughs> this would be perfect for <laughs> spot UFOs. I, t- I got I, the same I, ad and I had the <laughs> same thought. <laughs> Dude, you're so lucky. Now. You're so lucky you're getting ads that you're interested in the other day. Because I feel like it reveals so much about you. The other day, I had one for build your own hurdy gurdy. <laughs> I got that one too. Oh my God. What is wrong with I mean, I truly was like, I ha- I'm just, I quit. If that's the I, way the internet sees me, my algorithm just, I like, I just take me now. You're a hurdy gurdy man. I, I, get a little man I am a hurdy gurdy man. Uh, well, I bought. Bought it, so I can't wait to start scoping into the guy. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, totally. Oh, cool. I bought the hurdy gurdy, yeah. so <laughs> you know what? You know, you guys are living my better parallel. You're making all the right choices. You know what gets me is when they like put the original price and put it in, like red and a slash mark through it, and then it's like, but now it's only for you, forty nine ninety five. I'm like, what? They're practically giving it away. Bryce, we got to get you some night vision goggles. Yeah, I, you should see the some of the tech I've been playing with on uh, on. Well, and never mind your top secret project. Yes. We'll just leave it at that. Fantastic. <laughs> I hear someone whspering seven dollars. I do too. Yeah. What is that? I don't know. It's cosmic phenomenon. I'm I mean, serious. It's, what is that? It's Bryce's kids for sure. Oh, <laughs> trying to buy Fortnite's kids. That is so <laughs> funny. All I heard after you said like the price cutting is some <laughs> Uh, yeah, Bryce, oh, you know, he buys buys Fortnite gear for his kids, and then he buys UFO gear for himself. That's how <laughs> yeah, the deal nice. goes. Everybody gets to have fun. All right, anyways, here's this letter. Uh, this is entitled, Main UFO Encounter. So this is the story I mentioned on your Instagram account the other day. This took place on Labor Day weekend of either 1999 or 2000, as I was about 13, 14 years old. We took a camping trip up to Maine and stayed at a campground, of which the name escapes me now. I remember it was either near a military base or an airport, as all day, all weekend, we saw planes constantly. The sights we had were with two families in pop-up trailers, and I had a small two-man tent I planned to stay in. On the first night, everyone went to bed, including myself, alone in my tent. I awoke at some point in the middle of the night to some noises, assuming it was a small animal wandering around. When I fully awoke, I saw what I called Christmas lights, which I assumed were on another trailer I hadn't seen when I had gone to bed, Mm. but these were beyond bright and lit everything up outside my tent. I decided to unzip the window to my tent to take a look outside, and that's when I saw them. There were maybe five or six little greys wandering (gasps) around the sights we had. This, when they seemed to notice the noise I was making in the tent, and they stopped walking. I quickly zipped up the window and laid motionless in my tent as I heard them walk towards my tent and began making what I could only call clicking sounds. Oh, weird. Cool. Pocket mouths. I don't think I ever fell asleep that night, but if I did, I don't remember it. Needless to say, the rest of the weekend, I stayed in the trailer with my family as soon as it got dark. Love the show. Steve from Massachusetts. Wow. Thanks, Steve. Short and sweet and creepy. Straight to the grays. Straight to the grays. I don't get those much. No, no. That's wild. I I love that he was quiet in his tent. I would have been like, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. (laughs) Fuck me. Fuck. (laughs) Fuck the clicking. (laughs) I don't know. If people hear that coming out of a tent, Michael, they might be thinking something else. (laughs) And they might come in and fuck you. (laughs) What's my son doing to those aliens? (laughs) (laughs) Is my dad's worried about the aliens more than he is about me? (laughs) Greg Greg and Holly, I don't, you probably haven't listened to our Roswell series. But uh, one of the things that came up in the description of the alien bodies that were supposedly recovered from the craft is that their mouths were sort of uh, were, were, were not real mouths. They were just slits that were two inch deep pockets. 
as if they had evolved past the use of a mouth or were maybe some sort of uh, AI that just had it there for appearances. But uh, this clicking thing is a thing that we also hear. So it's possible that these aliens communicate uh, verbally or non-verbally by Smacking together their little pocket mouths. Just just the right size for a can of skull. <laughs> and there's nothing in, in the pocket. There's nothing in there that nope. would like we have tongue and teeth and stuff. It's just empty. It's just, just an the empty skull. little pocket, <laughs> like a coin purse. Huh. Mm. It's weird. And I think that's why they communicate tele you know, using telepathy, because they don't need to use use they don't use vo- their mouths to speak anymore. So have any of you ever heard any instance where they were dangerous or harmful to people? Wow. Um, yeah. Yes. They're, they're <laughs> <laughs> Whether they're true or those stories are true or not, we don't know. Yeah. There seems to be a, a split camp of uh, people who, you know, I, I'm thinking of the abduction experiences that, that people usually report. And, you know, there's a, there's a percentage of them where people feel that, uh, you know, it, it was a warm feeling and inclusiveness, uh, but then they're, they're, the majority of them are, are violation and, and uh, intrusion, and, and they're kind of just horror stories, but they, they sound awful. But yeah, I don't know. It's very strange. You know, having like experiments done on you and implants put on you in space hmm. uh, or in a UFO. So it can get creepy. I mean, I think the alien greys, they've always scared the shit out of me, but I'm trying to come around. I'm trying to face my fears and be cool with them, but I, I don't know. I don't know. None of that sounds as bad as 2020 here, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, good point. With that, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we have your final UFO L files. <laughs> Greg, do you want to kick off Act 2? For sure. Okay, here's our next letter. I'd like to share my experience with you. This happened back in 2001. I live in the northwest corner of Connecticut. Oh, maybe I should have used my northwest corner of Connecticut accent. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'd like to hear that now, please. <laughs> yeah. It just goes into a German accent, like a hard German accent. <laughs> Weirdly, it sounds exactly like how I'm talking now. Very rural area filled with small towns surrounded by farms and state parks with lots of hiking areas and large patches of state forest. Following a day of swimming midsummer, my friend Josh and I decided to pick up two girls we had met a few days earlier and head to a place called Dennis Hill. Oh yeah. Everyone get <laughs> <Nice>. action on <laughs> Dennis Hill. <laughs> Sexy uh, Dennis Hill. <laughs> I think Dennis was the first guy who like fingered a girl on that. Yeah, yeah. Like, Look yeah. Yeah. Dennis Hill after you, dude. You're a legend. <laughs> <laughs> Our hero. Uh, which is a large pavilion on top of a tall hill. On a clear night, visibility is good for miles. On this particular night, approximately 8.30 p.m., beautiful clear July evening, we could see all the way to Bradley International Airport, which is about 60 miles away toward the horizon. Just check out, just look at that airport. <laughs> yeah. Don't let Dennis work his magic. <laughs> <laughs> we were just conversing and watching the planes off in the distance when suddenly we noticed a bright red light come in very quickly from left to right out in the distance. It looked like it was going to hit a plane and the four of us gasped. Suddenly, it stopped dead from a high rate of speed to nothing. Then it seemed to begin shadowing a plane that was heading in our direction from west to east where we were. It moved slowly from left to right, slightly above the plane it was tailing. As it got closer, we noticed small, whiter lights on each side. We could hear the noise from the plane approaching, but nothing else. As the plane passed overhead at about the 2 o'clock position, we realized that the object was a perfect black triangle with a red light in the center and a white light at all three corners. Whoa, this is the exact same thing as the other one. It was at least three times the size of a plane. It stopped again over the tree line to our right as the plane continued east. Then, one by one, each white light blinked out and the red light in the center slowly faded out. We could still see the black triangle because the night was so clear and there were tons of stars out. We could see it just hovering there over the trees because it was blocking the stars. I'd estimate 5,000 feet up. There was a strange buzzing sound like a static on a radio. Our ears popped, and then we lost sight of it. Whoa. The whole the whole event lasted maybe six or seven minutes. 
This event reminded me of the story that Riley's girlfriend Grace shared about her childhood sighting with her mom. That's why I wanted to share this with you. We decided to leave. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, here we go. My phone died right as we. Uh, <laughs> right That's as we okay. Uh, here we go. We decided to leave since you're not supposed to be in these state parks after dark. Dark. The gate was open when we arrived. Sure, dude. And as we walked, and it's always leaves the gate unlocked. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, D. thanks, Big D. As we walked to my car, we saw headlights coming up the hill. We were terrified at this point, but it turned out to be an amateur astronomy group, astronomer group, that had permission to be there Friday nights. We actually told them what we saw, and they said that they see strange lights and things almost every night they are there. A lot of stuff happens in this area. I have other stories and a few newspaper articles I can share with you as well. Love the podcast, my friends. Keep up the great work. Love. Dennis. <laughs> the articles are all just about how to like pick up chicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fingering 101. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Dennis Hill teaches you the game. <laughs> <laughs> the black triangle stuff, man. I love a good black triangle story. I have a feeling that the black triangles might be like man made electromagnetic blimps. I've heard that theory that can move really fast, that they are huh. military craft. I, but I, who knows what that's really based on? Yeah, Maybe they're the uh, the planes that uh, what is it the F twenty five that Trump thinks is an, an actual invisible plane? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he keeps saying they're invisible. You can't see them, and everybody just stares at him blankly. And he's like, "You really, you can't see them. They're totally invisible." But Michael, um, you you recall that that episode we did on the Phoenix Lights and all the Delta shaped craft that uh, the thousands of uh, Phoenix residences saw? Yeah, and they were like transparent. The the balls of light that formed the. Uh, you know, the, the the apexes of the triangles would sometimes move from the craft and rejoin it. I mean, completely anomalous activity. I mean, I, this whatever those were aren't man-made. So, yeah, there's there's theories that uh, some of these like triangular black triangle crafts could be some of our own. But then some of the stories reported, you're just like, nope, not ours. I think the big boomerang shaped ones are are not ours, but I wonder if the black triangles with that red center light and then the three points at the end belong to us. Yeah, maybe. You know, do you guys you know when I watch those videos that the New York Times had posted and the and elsewhere, I always think about inertia as being such a crazy thing where the way those those orbs moved, there's just no human body that could survive the G forces of the way those things move. Oh, not yeah. at all. No it's, way. it's just so amazing because they not only do they move so much faster, they they come to complete stops, which would just make your brain collide into the front of your skull. You would die. Yeah, yeah. That's, no doubt that's, about it. That's why they have to like grow their little AI clone pilots with pocket mouths to survive <laughs> all that stuff. That's right. Click away. I think yeah. it's interesting how it was tailing the plane and why. And it makes me wonder, did the plane or the pilots or any of the mechanisms inside the plane have any knowledge of this? Did they detect it at all? It doesn't appear to, but who knows? But also why and then why did they stop? Like it, as you were reading, I was wondering, was it made me think like, was it just like quickly learning about whatever it could about the technology of the plane or how primitive it is? Or was it like reading the minds of everyone aboard? Was it looking for someone? Was it just collecting data? Were they just tailing it and making fun of it? Like, look at this piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All great questions. Yeah, I think the, they could have been alien teenagers trying to get a glimpse of Dennis <laughs> totally. in action, trying to pick up a few tips. <laughs> totally. There's, there does seem, Holly, there does seem to be a playful nature to these uh, yeah. to these things, whatever they are. So I wonder if there's just sort of that um, they're just following along to provoke curiosity or some sort of trickster playfulness. I, I don't know. It's very, very weird. Almost like dolphins do with a boat where they're yes. like interested and then they're like, all right, I'm going to go do something else. It's sort of boring. Exactly. Or, but and why did it stop? Did it stop because of Dennis Hill and it was like, ah, fingering's better? <laughs> or did it stop because it was de about to be detected? Did it get what it needed? Did it stop because of Dennis Quaid and it was receiving a frequency? <laughs> yeah. all the, full circle. These are, all the, these are all the correct questions we should be asking. We don't have answers. It stopped because it, be, it was being observed. Mm? 
Yeah, God. I think so. I think it's one of the, the user was ch- watching and it went, oh, hello, somebody sees us. Um, okay, let's move on. This is a note from listener Paula, uh, who had mentioned in one of our Instagram stories that she had a UFO story. And I said, hey, write into us at Bigfoot Collectors Club at gmail.com. That's where you want to send your L files. Uh, so she says, hello, Michael McMillan suggested I write to you about my experience seeing a UFO as a child. It happened just before the start of second grade, so that would be either the last week of August or the first week of September in 1976. For starters, it happened during the day. Most of the UFO stories I hear happen at night and involve lights in the sky, so my experience is different in that way. I lived on a mountain in eastern Pennsylvania. The houses were somewhat spread apart. My house had an acre of land, and my next-door neighbor, who was in this story as well, his house also had a acre of land, so there was a lot of open space and green grass for playing outside. Side note, this is exactly the type of neighborhood that I grew up in, sort of like 70s ranch-style houses with big yards. It was the best. My neighbor friend Lee and I were playing outside. Lee was the same age as me. It was a beautiful day with clear blue skies. First, I happened to notice that it looked like there was a star in the sky, but it was the middle of the day, and I had never seen a star in the sky in the middle of the day, so I pointed it out to my friend Lee. He also thought it was unusual, but we didn't let that worry us too much, and we went on with our play. I don't recall the exact game that we were playing, but we were definitely running around the yard, maybe playing tag or something. When we suddenly saw the craft hovering above his house, as if it had come out of nowhere, Lee and I were almost uh, uh, an entire yard apart from each other. It had made no noise at all. It was just suddenly there. We both noticed the craft at the same moment, and we both reacted the same way. We ran toward each other until we met in the middle of his yard, which was also directly in front of the craft, hovering just above his roof. We held on to one another tightly, both staring at the craft in fear and awe. It was saucer-shaped, and it was actually quite small. It was certainly smaller than the width of my friend's house. The craft hovered there for a short while and then left super fast and completely silent. After the craft flew away, we were no longer afraid, and we were actually amazed and excited that we had seen something so incredible. But no one believed us. I thought a lot about that day since then and i've wondered about that ship that hovered above my neighbor's house was it definitely a spaceship one thing for sure was that it was a serious piece of technology i also wondered about why that craft came down and hovered over my neighbor's roof why did it come right there i speculated that maybe they saw us notice them in the sky and they wanted to investigate who had seen them Also, being an adult now and knowing about things like physics, I suspect that what we had seen earlier in the sky may have been a larger vessel and a smaller craft was sent down to investigate. Uh Also, when I researched that time period, I found out that there was a famous abduction story that occurred just a few weeks before the time period of my experience. That incident was known as the Allagash Abduction. Oh, no way. Wow. And it occurred in Maine on August 20th, 1976. I just thought that was interesting that the experience I had was so close time-wise to this other very notable experience that 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 was had by a group of campers just a few weeks earlier. Well, I guess that's pretty much the whole story, Paula. I should wow. also add Lee's last name was Harvey Oswald <laughs> <laughs> Jr. Greg, <clears throat> Greg, I think we did our Allagash I know, abduction I was with, just, with you. BCS. I was just thinking that. Yeah. yeah, talk about another guy. Everything's coming full circle today. Yeah. Allagash, Allagash returns. Wow, wild. That I love that it was a saucer shaped, and her saying that it was smaller fits with the description of the Roswell craft as well, which was said to be twelve to fifteen feet in length and about four or five feet high. Um, so some of these flying saucers, especially the smaller, what we might call drones, are are not really that big. So pretty fascinating. Very cool. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, What's Bryce, left in the mailbag there? Oh, we I got, got one, one from you and then one from Riley. Oh, okay. Here we go. I see it right here. All right. Great. UFOL files. How's it going, guys and guests? Really digging the wet, hot alien summer segments of the show and interested to see what you guys have in store for the future. Anyways, the UFO story I have today is not actually mine, but someone else's. A couple of months ago, my neighbor was having a fire in their backyard. I got talking to her boyfriend, and we both bonded over our time in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. After six beers deep, I finally asked, You seen any UFOs up there? And his response was, I don't know what I saw, but I definitely saw something. I immediately grabbed another beer, cracked it open, and sat back and listened. John explained to me every year he and his friends go to Indian Lake in the Adirondacks and take their boat to an island for a few days to camp out on. One night, he and his friends were taking the boat back from the mainland, back to their island, when their engine cut out. When talking to John, I could easily pick up that he knew his way around a boat, so when he told me they could not figure out what was wrong with the engine, I believed him. All of a sudden, John said a massive blinding light came above them. He said it was so bright that they could not see anything around them. As fast as that light came, it disappeared. I immediately... Immediately, the engine kicked back on when the light went away. John said they were able to get back to their camping spot, but were terrified and just happy to get off the water for the night. After his story, I was shocked. John seemed like just a regular, hard-working guy who enjoyed the outdoors just as much as I did, and he even stated he had no idea if it was extraterrestrial or not. I asked him two questions. One, did you hear anything? And two, did you lose any time? He said he did not hear anything, and he was too scared to even think about looking at his watch. I believe he experienced something, and I think he does too, but who knows? Anyways, keep up the good work. Love the show. Daniel. Weird. Bryce, you know what you want to say to this, uh, the pseudonym of the man named John. Yeah, you know I do. John, you need to go get regressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, there's that, some classic UFO stuff in there. Engines shutting off, yeah. bright, bright, all-encompassing light. Well, and it's funny we're talking about that the uh, the Allagash abductions that took place near uh, the Adirondacks and in a lake too. And just like that, there was a there was this sort of um, bright, you know, sphere lighting up the entire lake, shining a beam down on the light. And it was only when uh, one of the guys, I forget his name, shined his flashlight back up at the thing to try and communicate that shit went wrong. So don't be, yeah. shining, don't be shining your flashlights up at those things unless you want to go for a nice little trip. Be shining your digital scope that you bought off Instagram at it. Like <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you know I will. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that, dude, that dude's on Alien straight up. That's just, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. No I, there. That's. That sounds like a real setup for an abduction to me, for yeah. sure. Yeah, they were uh, lucky. Yeah. Uh, Riley, why don't you wrap up this edition of L- of UFO L-Files for us and close out Wet Hot Alien Summer. Wow, we've come it's, We've come so far. I feel like we should play the MASH theme song or something. <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> what a summer it's been. All right. <laughs> Greetings, Bigfoot bros. My name is Bud, and this is my UFO story. Way back when, in the early 1990s, I was a young and impressionable lad. One night at my family's beach cottage, we were watching television, and on this trip... I know, seriously. (laughs) With a couple of girls that we picked up at... (laughs) Up on Dennis Hill. Dennis's Fingering Hill. All right. Uh, And on this trip, our parents let us watch inappropriate programs, such as Unsolved Mysteries... Uh, One or two UFO episodes in, I was hooked and absolutely horrified. Fast forward a couple winters, I was 9 or 10 years old, camping with some friends on a rural property in North Florida. After riding around for a spell, I love that turn of phrase, just for a spell, but anyways. Looking for deer and other critters, we decided it was time to head back to camp. As we rounded the sandy, dusty road, something caught our attention in the starry night sky. There was a large, orange, cigar-shaped object just hovering there, at an angle which seemed to put it right above our campsite. We only saw it briefly as we went around the bend. It seemed strange, and the short time we were able to see it didn't help calm my nerves. I was sure we would round the bend to see a craft landed at our campsite to take us. I told our friend's father to turn around, turn around, 
He didn't believe in flying saucers and sped along down the trail. I caught one last glimpse of the craft as it descended behind the trees, but when we got to camp, it was not there, and it wasn't anywhere. I still have no idea what this thing was, possibly an illuminated blimp? All I know is that it scared the absolute shit out of me, and that fear was real. Great podcast, boys. Keep it up. Bud B. Wow. And I went and bought some Swisher Sweets. More cigars. <laughs> yeah. More cigars, which makes me think maybe it wasn't a cigar at all with Clinton and Lewinsky in the yeah. Oval Office. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it was Haley. It's just it a was, c- cosmic phenomenon. He was trying to uh, he was trying to disclose the yeah. whole time. It was just it was there between the lines for us to figure it out. The very worst probe. <laughs> <laughs> they send down know. tiny ships to check things out. I swear I was. No, I did not have sex with that woman. I was probing her for my friends, the alien, the, the greys. Now, I heard there was pie around here. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? These stories have me convinced that I never want to go camping. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> with, I'm glad that that's job. what it's resulted in, Michael. That's a good, good conclusion there. Stay in the city, kids. Yeah. yeah. Just Keep sit in it. front of my air conditioner watching Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This, that's all these spaceships you need. <laughs> this quarantine thing ain't so bad after all. So, and, Holly... Oh, sorry. No, go yeah, ahead. Holly. No, I was going to ask you a question, so give me the answer before I even ask it. I've been watching a lot of spy stuff lately, and I've sort of learned that, like, all the different spy agencies, like in in Russia, Syria, uh, France, the United States, like, I, I learn, I've learned, I never really realized this, that, like, it's just kind of this big chess game. And so if I'm a spy from France that gets captured in Syria or whatever, like, I might get tortured in a prison for a while, but then I will be used as a bargaining chip and traded for something else, and it's all like what I've learned with a lot of these spies is like, yeah, yeah, you, you might get tortured a little bit, but like they're, they're not going to kill you because you're valuable in this in this game that we're playing. And then we'll get you back and we'll and we'll gain these certain we'll gain ground and blah, blah, blah. And that it's sort of this and that sometimes they even like give some of these spies like the choice, like we can intervene right now and bring you back. But you're about to have this thing happen. We know it. And it's your choice. Like you can go. It, you will get tortured a little bit but it will help us like gain some ground and so then the spies like all right i'll go get tortured and then i'll be brought back and i'll have more cred with the agency blah 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 like it's kind of badass i would never do it but maybe we should think about when the aliens like work on us and it feels like torture like we're we, we're part we're a piece like a valuable piece in this like bigger game of like knowledge and um it's it's all um it's all information. It's all um, intelligence. Maybe they're all the aliens are basically gaming each other. We're just the maybe the aliens are uh, all have their own individual agencies, and they're all that we're just the turf on which they're they're playing their cosmic <laughs> chess game. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. oddly, what you described, Holly, were also the exact rules to flashlight tag in my neighborhood growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you torture, you get tortured just a little bit, my and then you get to go bit. back to the Johnsons, we, and yeah, that's space. You. <laughs> I just imagine like an alien gray as he's sticking the probe where it doesn't belong. Now, if it makes you feel any better, think of this like uh, <laughs> like, a, like a spy game. <laughs> yeah. right. No, it, make, it doesn't make you feel better at all. <laughs> But all yeah. these people who've experienced this, you can basically say you're an agent. You're an intelligence officer. Yeah. No, it's a great – yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and there are definitely uh, people out there who would believe there are different races of alien beings that are all trying to outgame each other and are waging uh, sort of uh, wars like that in, in our own night skies. So, uh, you know, that's mm. a way deeper, weirder dive. Uh, Greg, Holly, I want to thank you for joining us uh, on this Thanks, guys. Uh, come down this party for Wet and Hot Alien Summer. I'm curious, after hearing these stories, does this bolster maybe your belief or uh, – or, or skepticism in in aliens and UFOs, guys. You've done nothing but bolster for me. Absolutely, right? right. Absolutely. That's what we're here to do. <laughs> yeah, Fantastic. like a nice pillow. We love it. Um, where can people find your work, guys? Uh, well, check out Mega the podcast. It's a improvised satire that is set inside a fictional mega church, and 
your very own Michael McMillan was just on what two weeks ago. Great episode. Yeah, oh, a nice. few episodes. By the time this airs, it'll be maybe three or four episodes back. So yeah, go check. that was so much fun. So he uh, plays the church wedding planner. You are so hilarious, and it is called uh, a pillowcase full of Bibles. Is the name of the episode <laughs> because because yeah. Michael's character was always beaten with a pillowcase full of Bibles. <laughs> Sounds right. Yeah. He does turn out to be sort of tragic figure. <laughs> he really does. He really does. <laughs> There's a lot of great, funny stuff, and thanks for doing it. It was it was hilarious. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a blast. Uh, mm-hmm. So definitely check out Mega the Podcast, um, and then uh, follow you guys on Instagram. Yeah, follow Greg at Hey Greg Hess on Instagram and Twitter, and I am um, at Holly Laurent. And of course, you can always follow us at Bigfoot Pod on Twitter at Bigfoot Collectors Club on Instagram. Uh, just because Wet Hot Alien Summer is winding down doesn't mean that you can't. Live the summer magic all year long with our Wet Hot Alien t-shirts that are up for sale at wearecampfire.media. Click shop, scroll down. You'll see the shirts by uh, artist James Maholland. Those are great. Check those out. Um, Riley, by the time this airs, we should be getting close to the premiere of the Club Bryce video, maybe? We're getting close. We're def- okay. we, we've definitely reached the. Um, I, I've got all my submissions in. Uh, but uh, it, it's coming. It's coming. Fantastic. Soon. So stay. Yeah. Uh, keep your eyes on our Instagram and Twitter for announcements uh, uh, about when you might see that. Also, do us one last favor. Go to Apple Podcasts. Give us a five star review. We'll read it here on the air, like this one from MC Bookkiss who writes more deep dives, five stars. It was so much fun listening to your detailed retelling of the Roswell story. I really dug the comedic dramatization sprinkled into the hyper detailed documentary style timeline. Bravo. Keep it up. Thank you so much. MC Bub kiss. We appreciate your support. Glad you enjoyed the Roswell. We'll definitely do more deep dives in the future. Bryce and I already have some wheels turning. All right, everybody. That wraps it up for our UFO L files and for wet, hot alien summer. There it is. I would like to end by saying $7. Oh my God. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> Title of the episode. Until next week. Good Thanks, night. fellas. It was so fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys. You guys are a blast. You're welcome back anytime. And if you have any more weird experiences, you too, we definitely want to hear about them. We will document. All right. So All right. Until- take care. Until next time. There's a tagline. (laughs) Good night. And go get regressed. (laughs) There it is. There it is. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.